first two. Okay. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to today's uh, seminar on uh, fire safety for complex buildings, the needs for, uh, for the heuristic design. I'm glad to be your host uh, for this event. Um, we're honored to have Peter Johnson over here, a uh, distinction fellow at Arup, joining us today to share his extensive knowledge and expertise in the fire protection engineering area, um, spending over more than 40 years. His profession career covers many different aspects of uh, fire safety from research, teaching, design consultation on a different range of uh, structures, including airports, um, railway station, terminals, and more. And uh, in today's presentation, we go into explored the concepts of complex buildings and the importance of comprehensive approach to fire safety uh, design as as well as uh, the crucial rules of the national construction codes placing our industry and peter will also talk about uh, fire hazards the potential fire scenario that's those form the foundation of the fire safety strategy and measures so without further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our speaker today, Peter Johnson, as him take us on the journey into the world of the fire safety for complex buildings. So the virtual stage is yours, uh, Mr. Peter. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you can all hear me and you can see the screen as well. Uh, hopefully that's the case. Um, yes, we do. Yeah, good. So the, the title, Fire Safety Complex Buildings, I'll explain why the word complex is in there. And I'll talk about this need for holistic design. Um, so as uh, Zoe Roy has indicated, um, I'll touch on the uh, what we mean by performance requirements in the National Construction Code or BCA. What are complex buildings? Uh, and why is the word complex used um, and look at the definition of complexity, which people often use as a as a cinnamon, synonym, if you like, or as a, an equivalent of the word risk uh, and why people want to avoid the word risk, particularly governments. A um, bit about the design process and why, particularly with complex buildings, the approach to holistic fire safety design uh, encompassing all aspects of fire safety should be the approach, even though um, it's sometimes not adopted in Australia at this point in time. And for holistic fire safety engineering, what are the benefits and what are some of the concerns? They're the things that I'll uh, touch on in this presentation. First of all, starting with the National Construction Code and uh, Many fire safety engineers, mostly involved with volume one of the building code um, for a wide range of buildings. And that building code has a series of performance requirements in, and I've put one typical one on the on the screen. Um, up until 1996, we had a building code, but it was prescriptive. It basically told you um, how many exits you needed to have, what the distance was to exits that you had to comply with, um, and set out quite prescriptive um, requirements that needed to be followed when you designed a building. In 1996, and uh, we had BCA 96, which was the first full performance code in the in, that we had in Australia as a model code to be used um, in all the states and territories. And that set out a series of performance requirements, which were the legal requirements. And so here it says for exits, it doesn't tell you how many, it doesn't tell you where you need to put them, it doesn't tell you how far apart they are. It just says you must provide them to allow occupants to evacuate safely, um, being appropriate to you know, the travel distance, the distance people need to get to exits, the number of mobility, so-called of the occupants, 
function of the building and so on. That was the performance requirement. That's the legal requirement. The building code, though, though does to help people who are not familiar with trying to work out how you might answer that question in a design, puts in some prescriptive provisions, um, the so-called deemed to satisfy. And here's some examples. It says, for all buildings, each building must have at least one exit. For class two to eight buildings, and we'll touch on what they are in a moment, you need you could have a horizontal exit, but you must have another two exits. And in basements, you must have certain well, number of exits. Shoulder. You must have certain... you. Sorry, um, somebody's there's a bit of noise in the background, but anyway, I'll continue on. Um, it sets out the uh, details, but you don't need to follow these. So in theory, you could build a building with no exits at all, or you could build a building with only one exit where the prescriptive provisions say that you must have two or more. So you don't need to follow those. These are not legal requirements. They're just one way of satisfying the performance requirements. And that shows up in, in this uh, little illustration that's often made for the building code of requirements. The performance requirements are the legal requirement. How you satisfy that legal requirement um, can be at least in a couple of different ways. You can follow the prescriptive or deemed to satisfy solution if you wish to, um, or you can develop a performance solution um, using first principles, fire engineering and fire engineering analysis and show how you're going to meet that performance requirement by any which way you decide to choose yourself as a fire safety engineer. So that's a really important thing to understand in the context of the rest of this presentation. The legal requirement of the performance requirements, how you achieve those descriptive performance requirements is, is up to you as the designer. The prescriptive requirements, um, and in fact, the performance requirements overall in the building code are driven effectively by whatever building class you're looking at. And so in the building code, it sets out 10 classes of buildings. The first four are all related to residential type buildings. Class one, which is houses, class two, which is uh, apartment buildings uh, with sole occupancy units. Um, class three and four are other classifications which include um, uh, aged care and, uh, uh, and other forms of uh, childcare centres and other forms of residential occupancy, effectively where people uh, sleep uh, and so are covered by those first four classes. The class five of the offices, class six shopping centers, class seven car park and storage, uh, class eight process or industrial type buildings, um, class nine healthcare and assembly buildings, including airports and things like that. Uh, and class 10 are just special uh, non-habitable structures, farm sheds and other things like that. And Depending on which one of the classes you're dealing with in your design of the particular building, then that will set out the requirements uh, in terms of the performance requirements and will set out a set of prescriptive deemed to satisfy requirements that you can follow if you wish to, but you don't have to. There are some other drivers for design. The height of the building, many of you will know that for buildings over 25 metres in, in Australia, has a whole lot of extra performance requirements and prescriptive provisions um, that relate to the height of the building. And that's been the case in the building code for many, many years, um, uh, probably 30 or 40 or 50 years, even before we had performance-based uh, design requirements. It was driven by the building class. That told you what requirements you needed to follow. More recently, this idea of complexity or building complexity has been introduced. Um, and in fact, there's been a definition put in the Building Code of Australia, the latest 2020, 2022 version, has put in a, a definition of complexity, which I'll come to. Um, but it's not used in anywhere in the Building Code. So it, it sits there, uh, but it's 
It's not used to drive any of the provisions at the moment. It's there because somebody thinks that they will use that definition of complexity to drive requirements for buildings in future issues of the building code. And so this concept of complexity has been used um, and people are starting to think about whether that might be a better concept for um, prescribing the requirements of fire safety and other provisions in the building code. Um, and this word complexity is used, it really should be perhaps the word risk. In other words, for buildings that are at higher risk or higher complexity, buildings that are higher risk, there should be more provisions in the building code for those and more stringent provisions. So if we see the picture on the right, a timber building, um, if that building um, is of say four stories high, there should be, uh, and it's the timber building, then there'll be certain provisions. If it goes to eight stories or 12 stories, then there should be additional provisions. If the building's not made of timber, but made of steel or concrete, maybe the requirements don't need to be quite so uh, stringent. So this idea of complexity is growing and being used as a, uh, really a, the equivalent of risk, but it's starting to get some interest from building code writers and regulators. Um, as, as, um, and you'll see it appear in the, in the literature. So what is a complex building? Um, if you had a definition for complexity, what would that be? Now this is Chadson Shopping Centre in Melbourne. Uh, it's a huge building, tens of thousands of people in it, open floors between levels, a uh, very fancy roof. Um, is that a complex building? That's the question of how do you determine whether it's a complex building or not. Another one, a high rise, a moderate high rise, in fact, timber building with a timber frame. Um, is that a complex building because it's made of timber rather than steel? That's a question that people are thinking about. This is a kindergarten. Um, and if it's on the ground floor of a building, is that a complex building that needs special provisions? What about if you put that, as increasingly has happened, that kindergarten on the fourth floor, or the fifth floor, or the 10th floor of a high rise building? Does that make the building higher, more complexity, uh, higher risk, and therefore have to have extra provisions? That's a question that people are thinking about. And this is an industrial building. If this is storing timber on 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 the pallets on on racks, is that a complex building? Does that mean that building needs extra provisions? What happens if the things that are on the racks are simply all made of metal? non-combustible. Is that less complex, lower risk, and therefore it needs a lot less provisions um, than might otherwise be? Um, what about if there are chemicals stored on those rock racks? Is that more complex, higher risk, and need extra provisions? Well, the ABCB definition, and you could look up the latest version of the uh, Building Code of Australia, Volume 1, and you'll find the definition in there. But, and we won't go into too much detail, but it has a number of drivers, if you like, or, or parameters which determine the level of complexity or level of risk. One is this term complicated, which perhaps isn't a very useful term, but if the building has innovative materials, which some people would use mass timber at the moment as one of those, or very innovative design, um, you know, really complex structural design. Um, and that requires performance solutions to work out how to satisfy the performance requirements, then maybe that's complicated and should score some points towards being a complex building. If it's in a high hazard area where it might be subject to natural hazards such as bushfires and floods or other industrial hazards, is that more complicated and therefore more comp makes a more complex building. What about if it's over 50 metres? That's what I, ABCB is using now in its complex definition. So height, if you have a, you know, a building of 25 metres high, residential building, let's say, or of 500 metres high, is there a difference in terms of the level of risk? And people would think there are. And so height becomes one of the factors. 
the the organizational factors are is it is it being procured in a very complex way what are the contract for for design and construction of this building um are there special needs for maintenance and inspection that are going to have to continue through the life of the building some of those may be risk related and therefore have an impact on comp on complexity and then what about vulnerable occupants if it's a building let's say that's a typical office building with a relatively low number of disabled people then that might be one level of risk or complexity what about though if it's a high-rise building um, with um, uh, health and aged care um, um, occupants and, and maybe kindergartens, daycare and other things in there where you've got a, a, a large number of uh, people and a large number of people with um, disability, uh, then many more vulnerable occupants and therefore perhaps higher risk. Um, and the last category is, is it a building that in post-disaster recovery um, is very important to the community and, and needs to be there. So if you pick a, a very isolated city out in regional Australia and there's a hospital there, it's the only one for 500 kilometres around and, and it's in a flood prone area, is that something that's going to need extra measures uh, put in there? And, and is that going to be um, described as a complex building? Well, without going into too much more detail of that, the National Construction Code effectively scores buildings on those different criteria um, and puts them in different categories. Category one, typical low rise building, less than 100 occupants, less than 10 vulnerable occupants on, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a category four building, really complicated, high rise, maybe mass timber over 100 occupants, lots of vulnerable people. Um, and these categories would then be used to describe the buildings in terms of its complexity or risk, which would be used to drive the design um, of those buildings and set out some of the requirements for those buildings. And this approach to complex, complex buildings and building complexity or risk is, um, is uh, occurring not only in Australia, but um, these types of criteria are appearing in the International Building Quality Centre, which is centred in Canberra in Australia, um, which is pr uh, producing um, buildings of, of, of uh, different complexity and trying to describe them in Germany. Also, the International Building Code in the US is starting to grapple with this concept of complexity as the driver for design rather than the class of buildings, which is what we've used traditionally. And various words are being used. Um, complex, in the BCA, they're using the word complex. Really what they mean is risk. And other people are saying, well, it's not risk because we're not dealing with the probability of these things. We're really look, talking about the consequence. What happens if you have a fire in this building? What are the consequences for the occupants or for the building or its collapse or or people have used well it isn't consequence because it hasn't happened but potential com consequence so all of these terms are being interchangeable and you'll find in the literature um, that these various range of words are being used sometimes interchangeably um, there's a link there to the definition if you want to go and look at it in, in more detail but that's the basis of of building complexity as being a driver for design now, rather than the class of buildings as we've used in the past. Although, you know, they're somewhat related. Complex buildings, why, why are people developing um, these concepts of complex buildings? Well, as I've said, it's really as a driver for maybe a changed approach to the development of performance requirements and whether people should be able to use performance solutions uh, and develop performance-based design briefs, or whether they're forced to use and follow prescriptive designs only. So that's one use that people are thinking might be the case for developing the complexity value of a building or the risk of that building to drive what you're allowed to do in terms of performance solutions to meet performance requirements. 
Another thing that people are thinking about is, okay, what about perhaps category three and category four, the high risk buildings, maybe they all will need a peer review. That is, you'll have fire safety engineers who develop the design, but there'll be a mandatory requirement to go and have a separate uh, firm of fire safety engineers review the designs um, and undertake a peer review. And you can imagine at the moment for, let's say a hundred story mass timber building using glue lamb and CLT timber um, on a big floor plate in an office building, that would make a heck of a lot of sense um, because there's a lot of unknowns um, that would uh, that uh, that exist in the design of those buildings currently. So perhaps the need for peer review could be driven by this idea of building complexity. What about mandatory inspections? Certainly there's a lot of discussion already in Australia and other places to say um, we might need to do more mandatory inspections by the building official or the building surveyor um, who's doing the building approvals. Um, at the moment, for a lot of buildings, there are four mandatory inspections. They're pretty simple. They to do with the the um, ground conditions and the, the footings for the building, the building structure, the other measures that you put into a building, including fire safety measures, and then a final inspection. But for these high, highly complex buildings, um, maybe the number of mandatory inspections by the building surveyor needs to increase in proportion to the risk. So for simple warehouse buildings, maybe we don't even need four mandatory inspections anymore. It could be three or two. But for you know category four building, maybe there needs to be 10 mandatory inspections uh, given the higher risk level. Does there need to be specialized commissioning um, of things like smoke control and uh, and and other measures in the building. Um, and the last thing is certainly suggested by, by a number of us that at least for the higher category buildings, if not all, they should adopt the principles of holistic design. And I'll describe in detail what holistic design is about and why that is a good idea. Um, so, this building complexity idea is certainly um, growing in interest, not only in Australia, but other places as being a better way of describing effectively the risks, if you like, in the building and how the design should, um, uh, the design should uh, be developed to meet those risk requirements uh, and provide an adequate level of safety. Um, in order to, to think about holistic design, we just need to touch on um, the development of a fire safety design generally. And um, um, so I've set out on this slide and the next one, how, how it kind of typically works. So what we find is we a client will come along with uh, um, a building that they want to design or a piece of infrastructure. Uh, it could be a high-rise office building, it could be a low-rise residential building, it could be a, um, a, a piece of infrastructure, and they'll have some requirements. And it obviously, if it's a building, it needs to fit with the Building Code of Australia, at least and meet the performance requirements. There may be some other objectives. Um, the client may have some objectives in terms of operational continuity or or business interruption, may have some special requirements for asset protection or insurance requirements. They will need to be understood in the early part of, of the design and involvement of a fire safety engineer. There may be a feasibility study having been undertaken um, and a preliminary fire safety report on effectively the concept design, outlining what the building's about, what are the key, in our case, what are the key fire safety features in that concept design? Um, that's going to be necessary to meet the performance requirements of the building code. From there, the design is then developed further and sometimes called scheme design in more detail. And at that point, often fire safety engineers will need to develop their fire engineering brief or performance-based design brief and then do a whole lot of analysis and modelling and develop the fire safety um, engineering report. And once that's been developed, 
then into detail design, um, the fire safety system designers will go to work and develop design in detail, the smoke control, the sprinklers, the detectors, the exit signs, um, architects will do the egress provisions um, and all the other measures that for fire safety need to go into the building and put that together in a set of drawings and design specification that can go out for tender. So what will happen is that the that those that design package will go out for tender. People will make bids or put in submittals of how they're going to meet those tender requirements. And sometimes a fire engineer or safety engineer will have to go and uh, undertake a review of what's proposed by the tenderer, or the builder, the developer, and look to see whether it's okay. If it all go is okay and a contract is let, then it will go into construction. And during construction, fire and safety engineers will sometimes uh, be asked to come and undertake inspections, witness commissioning, um, and then the building will be completed, hopefully satisfactory, given its certificate of occupancy and handed over to the client uh, who asked for it in the first place. And hopefully now in Australia, start to be given a fire safety manual uh, that sets out how the building is supposed to work, what the fire safety provisions are, how emergency management is to be conducted, <clears throat> what the procedures are, and also what maintenance needs to be undertaken um, in that building. So that's the, the design process um, through this series of stages that typically the fire safety engineer uh, hopefully is engaged in um, to uh, help with the design of the building. Sadly, in Australia, at times, the practice has been when the building is in construction, problems arise. And so fire safety engineers are brought in to say, all right, there's a problem here. It doesn't meet the performance requirement of the building code. Can you fix it? Can you develop a performance solution uh, that will fix that problem? And in, you know, that is far too late in the whole design process. When that happens, um, you know, it's a major problem. There's a lot of pressure on um, and uh, the performance solutions that are developed often will not be very good. And sometimes they'll be uh, um, not good solutions at all and just quick fixes um, and very costly uh, when they come at the end of the uh, that period. Um, and I won't go into this in detail, but David Lang, at your UQ uh, developed this for a presentation that we did uh, back in 90, uh, back in 2021. Um, this is a so-called or a uh, developed form of the Nordic hierarchy of uh, requirements uh, under a typical um, building code where you start with a goal uh, that is to develop a safe building uh, for the occupants, set it out in functional statements and develop some other requirements um, and, and these so operative requirements are really the performance requirements. And in Australia, those operative requirements or performance requirements are the only legal requirement. Not the goal, not the functional statements, although in some countries they are legal requirements as well. But in Australia, the performance requirements are the, are the things that we need to uh, uh, comply with. And we need to set out then how we're going to meet that through, as we've said traditionally, that's through the building classification, which is typically the class of buildings in Australia. Then there'll be requirements written into the building code and you can satisfy those performance requirements either with theme to satisfy solutions or performance solutions or some combination thereof. And then verify that, that those uh, solutions meet the operative or performance requirement using a verification method. As we said, in Australia, the performance requirement is the legally enforceable one. The two above it are not in Australia. So how does that work in practice? Um, it's probably best by talking about an example. Um, and the example I've, I've put here is just a typical office building and typical design practice in the past in Australia anyway, has really been that this these designs have been driven by a building code approach, often an approach um, put forward by the 
building surveyor uh, who's not a fire engineer at all, by, but by a building surveyor who understands all the clauses of the Building Code of Australia. And this building might have um, not follow the, the prescriptive requirements. It might have reduced fire resistance levels. You know, in a typical building here, it might be reduced from two and three hours to 90 minutes fire resistance. Might have extended travel distances that go beyond the 20 metres and 40 metres of the prescriptive requirements in the code. Um, you might exit this building through the foyer, which is a no-no. Uh, if you follow the prescriptive requirements, so you might come down some stairs into the foyer and then out. It might have natural smoke um, extraction system in the in the atrium in the middle of this building rather than mechanical, which is the prescriptive requirement. It may have been under 25 metres and not required sprinklers, but as compensation for these changes to the prescriptive requirements, sprinklers might be added to the building to increase the level of safety, um, and it may have no hose reels. But otherwise, the building might follow all of the prescriptive, otherwise follow all the prescriptive solutions. The compartment sizes might be the same as in the building code. It might have a standard AS1675 detection alarm system. The exit signs uh, could be standard. Um, portable extinguishers might be standard. So it might be a mixture of a series of performance solutions related to some of these measures here and all the rest prescriptive solutions. And what the fire engineers have been asked to do is simply look at and justify these few performance requirements and not look at the rest of the building at all. And in some cases, it might be one fire safety engineer has employed the look at the reduced fire resistance levels and another fire safety engineer brought in to justify there being no hose drills. And as you can imagine, a lot of these requirements and performance requirements are not linked together or looked at in a holistic manner. They are looked at in silos or uh, independent of each other. Um, and the solutions that arise out of that whole process may not be very sound at all fundamentally. But that's been the design practice driven by the building surveyors largely in Australia um, since 1996. Fortunately, it's changing in a lot of cases, but in many cases, that's been the standard practice. So as a fire engineer, you might get brought in to look at extended travel distances, and that's all you look at. Um, and certainly you don't go back necessarily and look at what all the prescriptive solutions are. You have a throwaway line in your, um, in your report, which simply says all other measures follow the prescriptive requirements of the building code. This is how a lot of people got into trouble with cladding on buildings, combustible cladding on buildings, because building surveyors said the cladding on the outside of the building is follows the prescriptive requirements or deemed to satisfy requirements of the building code. Therefore, as fire engineers, fire safety engineers, you don't need to look at it. Um, and we know where that all led with all of the combustible cladding issues. What's good practice? Well, good practice is to think as a real engineer and to follow and understand um, the issues of fire safety from first principles. Um, and I've listed some of the questions that you might ask at the concept design stage of a of a uh, uh, a building where um, you're going to look at um, all of the fire safety measures from first principles. Uh, the picture on the the top right is of the Macquarie building, which has got a external um, uh, uh, structure which supports this building rather than an internal structure. And this building was designed absolutely from first principles and had to be because of its innovative design. Um, and so it's got this diagrid structure on the outside. Um, and you couldn't have designed this to meet the prescriptive requirements of the building code in many different ways. So all these sort of questions you listed here are things that we as fire safety engineers should ask at the start of a, of a project. And we should get involved um, in these issues right from the start of the project and be appointed um, in early concept design. And you know the last line down here in the picture you see on the right is that increasingly, there's a whole lot of new hazards going into buildings, electric vehicles, lithium ion batteries, um, charging facilities, 
um, and what's coming, hydrogen in vehicles and so on. Um, we need to look at those very, very carefully. So that's much more what good practice is about. And in order to really set that in some context from a terminology point of view, this is uh, some words that David Lang came up with um, when we worked together on the Warren Centre project, that the fire safety strategy is an ensemble, a group of all the measures that go into the building. And not only the measures such as detection, alarm, evacuation, active uh, uh, suppression, passive protection, the structure, but also the management procedures and the maintenance all need to work together if you're going to ensure the adequate performance of a fire in a building. And that design package, the fire safety strategy, that total package should be started in concept design and developed all the way through um, in a holistic approach until the project is completed and handed over. And that's what we say is the development of the fire safety strategy and the holistic approach, which is much more a professional engineering approach rather than a building code mix and match uh, of requirements approach. So if we look at some examples of buildings that have had this holistic design approaches to the Beijing Aquatic Center, uh, with a fire engineering designed out of Sydney by Mary Ann Foley, um, this building didn't comply with just about any of the prescriptive requirements of the uh, Beijing building code or the China building code that was applied to this. Um, Effectively, the book was thrown away and Marianne went back to first principles. Obviously, this was challenging because the outside structure of this is, is combustible pillows, if you like, um, that sit around the building of combustible plastic. And the distance to the exits, the number of exits, the so-called vomitories where you walk out of the thing through these openings and into the concourse behind, uh, the length of the building, uh, all of these things, normally under this building code, this, the, the roof of this would have to have sprinklers, which it doesn't. Um, this required a total first principle holistic design and ended up with a brilliant award-winning uh, structure um, designed using holistic design principles. Chadson Shopping Centre, as I said, um, is, is work that, that we do in every stage of that building. Um, we usually get engaged even before the architect to set out the requirements holistically and work all the way through until the opening of each stage of this building in a holistic design approach. And you can see the, you know, the brilliant architecture that, that results in the functionality of this building. It's the biggest shopping centre in Australia um, and keeps being extended and extended and there's more work going on there at the moment. So in terms of a definition of holistic design is the development of the overall fire safety strategy for all measures in the building, including um, the inspection, commissioning, the development of an owner's manual to address all the performance requirements, not just a few, to design to meet all the performance requirements using fire safety engineering um, practice uh, effectively from first principle. It's a different approach to what typically has been used in Australia in the past. To finish off, I'll just highlight some of the benefits and the risks associated with this holistic design approach, which is getting increasing attention um, in Australia. A, it's a, it's a true professional engineering approach. It's using the skills of professional fire safety engineers in the very first best approach. Um, it's thinking is based on thinking first principles and design first and the code second. In other words, let's design the building and then let's see how we can fit it into the building code, not think building code first and then design second. It's developing this whole package of fire safety measures uh, set to the whole project uh, rather than silos uh, of, of, of uh, different bits of the fire safety package being developed in different ways. It really, uh, if you start from uh, early concept design, you end up with the best building functionality um, and the opportunities for innovation. Um, and it's about 
getting it right first time, as I say, less design and construction mistakes rather than bringing in fire safety engineers towards the end of a project to fix up stuff ups. Um, it's getting it right from the beginning. And this is totally fitting with the way regulators now, such as David Chandler in New South Wales, are driving the design, saying, getting it right first time, get the design right from the beginning, um, and you'll have a lot less construction mistakes and delays further on in the project. And in the end, it's really all about providing quality and safe outcomes for consumers. Um, are there concerns with this holistic design approach? Well, it's going to require more fire safety engineering input and therefore the fees are going to go up. That's a good thing, or it should be a good thing. Some people are concerned that that's going to um, uh, drive some developers to go away from go away from performance solutions and go back to basic prescriptive design. I don't think we're seeing any, any evidence of that at the moment. Because fire safety engineers are going to have to look at the whole building, does that mean they increase their professional liability and their professional indemnity insurance is going to go up? I think that's a furphy as well. We've seen in legal cases where people who haven't taken the holistic approach uh, have been professionally liable, even though they claim to be professional fire safety engineers. Is there a challenge from availability of fire safety engineers? The answer to that is yes. We need four times as many students as like you at UQ as we've got there at the moment. We need every one of you to go out and find three engineering colleagues who are undergrads and get them to do the course at UQ. Um, you know, there's a, there's a huge need, not only in Australia, but around the world for fire safety engineers. For instance, in our New York office of Arab, we went out and tried to find 12 fire safety engineers in one single recruitment campaign. Um, there's a massive challenge out there. Um, it's a great time to be a fire safety engineer. The opportunities are huge. Is there a competency challenge? There is um, getting involved in early design and being able to talk design of fire safety, not just analysis and modeling, but talk design of fire safety in the early stages of a project is really important. So if you really enjoy that side of designing things from first principles from the beginning, that's we need more people who can do that. And we also need more people who can go out and do inspections on site and do commissioning. And, and that's a challenge for the education programs for fire safety engineering um, at UQ, at University of Western Sydney and other things is how do we, how do we de develop programs that will meet all the challenges that are out there at the moment. New competencies, I won't dwell on this, but there are new competencies being written uh, and David Lang was hugely involved in that. And we've published papers uh, that set out what those competencies are. And the question is often, where is the evidence? Where is, what are the benefits? We've talked about the benefits, but the evidence for the need for holistic design, particularly <coughs> if new requirements for complex buildings are going to drive the requirements for complexity. Well, the evidence is really there in the Warren Centre research that we were heavily involved in. The Shergold, Weir and Hackett reports after Grenfell um, certainly highlight that importance of competency and not just following prescriptive rules. There's some re recent legal cases uh, that we've published on which really highlight the need for holistic design. ABCB is changing their policy. Um, and the workplace health and safety legislation, which applies to buildings, but people often forget, really emphasizes this holistic design as well. And it's coming in, in other places like the new regulations in New South Wales. And it's really encouraged by the fire engineering guidelines document, which we should all be following uh, when we design um, buildings using fire safety engineering. Um, we need to work quickly because and some of you will have seen some of these slides before, but there's a whole lot of dodgy fire safety engineering going on. Here we see in the middle, cables and gas pipes running between apartments through what should be a fire rated wall. It's simply made out of timber and, and, uh, and got openings. And the one below it, oh, there was a bit of an opening there. We know it needs to be blocked up. 
So we blocked it up with uh, expanded combustible polystyrene. Uh, and there are just enormous number of defects in buildings at the moment, particularly waterproofing and mold coming into buildings. Also, um, a lack of protection uh, of probably what's a fire rated wall, but leaving um, reinforcing exposed. Um, there's a big need. Um, the last slide really is remembering Grenfell. Um, terrible fire. So many people died, uh, many of them disabled, uh, many of them people who don't understand English. Um, the question is should we be pushing for this first principles, holistic design buildings for these buildings of higher complexity or higher risk because of the structure, the height, and the number of vulnerable people? And how do we make sure they're designed by registered competent fire safety engineers? In Australia, we're seeing more requirements for registration. In the UK, for some bizarre reason, they're not suggesting that fire safety engineers need to be registered or licensed by government. Uh, they're leaving it to the market. I think that's a, that's a huge mistake. There are the conclusions. I'll leave it there. And uh, uh, Zero, I'll open it up to, um, to questions if people have got uh, questions. Thanks, I don't Mr. see any in the in the, uh, in the chat, but people might have. Yeah, we get to a lot of open audience. up and ask questions. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Any questions from? Yeah, we we got one. Um, yeah, we got so yeah three from one. Let me. Uh, thank you. A few questions about the practice of performance in Australia. Australia, will you also apply performance solution to simple buildings such as an apartment and only to complex buildings? Yeah, that's a, it, it's a good question. Uh, the practice, in fact, is that virtually 90% of buildings in Australia have some performance solutions. And you might think of a low-rise apartment building as a relatively simple building and, and not very complex or not very high risk, um, but they will have, typically will have performance solutions. Low-rise apartments will often have one stair rather than two, we'll have sprinklers added, uh, we'll have extended travel distances, um, and may, if they put sprinklers in, eliminate hose reels. Um, so, uh, and one of the problems in Australia is that simple buildings, relatively simple apartment buildings, are, are being designed and built by people who a few years ago were building single houses. And they are the buildings that have the most defects in them when people go, when governments go out and do audits. So they perhaps are not going to score that highly on the complexity uh, thing, but but um, certainly residential buildings um, have, you know, a pretty poor performance in Australia at the moment. And while they're simple, they will certainly typically have a number of performance solutions applied to them. Next question, can I assume performance-based design may require high design costs? The answer is yes, um, because you've got to pay for the fire safety engineer in the first place. Um, and the question is whether it is worth it for a simple building. And I think the clear answer, is certainly from the government in New South Wales, for example, is by getting the fire safety engineer, sorting all the problems out in an early stage, you save a whole lot of construction uh, defects and construction costs that need to be fixed up. I can give you one example, not fire safety related, but one of the, or the three big issues in buildings at the moment, particularly residential, as described from the statistics in New South Wales, the three are structural defects, fire safety defects, particularly in terms of penetration and waterproofing problems and waterproofing and water yeah, proofing design. Um, one building that David Chandler showed us, he sent his orders out a few days before completion and issue of the certificate of occupancy. There were $15 million worth of defects. Every single shower in, the, in every apartment had to be taken out and replaced. Uh, there was water penetration through the roof. 
because the roof was flat instead of having a slope on it. Um, so good design using appropriate performance space requirements or solutions where appropriate may cost a bit more in design, but it's going to reduce the costs in construction and ultimately reduce the cost to building owners. Because what's happened in the moment, many of those defects are not being picked up. Building owners of new apartments are finding that they have to pay a lot of money to have them fixed even soon after they're, uh, um, th they've occupied them. The next question, who is responsible for the approval of proposed performance solution by engineers? Well, it's uh, typically the building surveyor. They approve them. But if they think they are not able to <clears throat> evaluate them properly, then, um, then they will ask for a peer review or the fire brigade will ask for a peer review because the the typically performance solution need to be put before the, the fire authorities or the fire brigade as well. Um, so it will often be the building surveyor and the and or the fire brigade. But also there is provisions in in most states for an expert panel. So in Victoria, it's called the building referees, and you people can call um for the design to be put before the building referees and they convene an expert panel um, who will review and decide whether the building um, should be given its building approval or not. So there are, there are different pathways for, for that. Um, and you would think the more complex the building, the higher the risk the building, the more need would there be for peer review or expert panels to do that. What design problems are commonly seen in Australia which require a performance solution? Well, I've touched on a number of those in the example, but yeah, exceeding travel distances, lack of exit numbers, um, reduced structural requirements in terms of fire resistance levels, um, exceeding compartment size, um, and they're usually solved in Australia by yeah timeline analysis by comparing ASAT versus RSAT or structural modeling. Um, and uh, um, those are, are the typical ways that it's, that it's done. In some other countries or in some other jurisdictions, there's a, a, a desire to go to risk-based uh, performance, uh, quantitative risk assessment methods. Um, and they, and that's even been suggested in, in Australia, but that's problematic really because the lack of data and the lack of agreed methodologies for doing that. So deterministic analysis um, and maybe qualitative risk assessments are the typical ways in which it's done. Um, and, and the challenge in the timeline analysis is the development of appropriate scenarios. Um, too often we see one or two very simple scenarios being uh, looked at rather than multiple scenarios being looked at at sufficient detail. So that would be the answer to those questions. Are there? That's good. I'm happy to provide those answers. Any other questions then? Yeah, we have a, oh, yeah. another sustainable, few questions. Yeah. Sustainable and green buildings. Is that the next one? Ah, uh, no. Uh, yeah, um, so this question of how can we demonstrate the reliability of performance based design? Is that the next one? Is there room? Yes, yes. Okay, how, how can, can we, we demonstrate, demonstrate? The, the reliability of performance based design? May, particularly when government and clients may prefer to follow codes, even though they don't represent the good design in general. Um, well, um, I, I guess the in a way, the proof is in the put. The, the the proof of the pudding is in the eating. In that, as I said, about ninety or ninety five percent of all buildings have some degree of performance based design. Uh, many buildings, particularly government buildings, um, including uh, hospitals, will have many performance solutions. There may be buildings that have ten or twenty or thirty performance solutions. Um, and and clients will do that because they're aiming to get better functional functionality out of their buildings, 
for instance, in hospitals, if you try to maintain the prescriptive zone sizes of 500 square metres for a smoke zone or 1,000 square metres for a fire rated zone, um, that might not fit with the way the rooms need to work for for a hospital. They need the the compartments may need to be smaller or larger. So, working out the compartment sizes to fit with the functionality of the building is a very good reason for having a performance solution. Um, and that may then result in uh, extended travel distances or having to move exits in different places beyond the prescriptive requirements to, in order to fit with the, the functionality of the building. So people will do that and they'll do it very, very regularly because it represents good design uh, in terms of functionality or innovative design um, because they want to see, let's say in the, in the uh, entrance to the building, a very um, you know, fancy, elaborate, innovative structure Maybe done with you know with with mass timber um, that doesn't fit with the prescriptive requirements of the building code. So they want to get some aesthetic value or building functionality or optimize the design in terms of the cost. They would typically be the drivers, and uh, and we would use performance based uh, solutions to meet the performance requirements and show that they are satisfactory using. The principles of fire safety engineering. So that perhaps answers that question, I hope. Sustainable and green building have become increasingly popular in recent years. Can there be a natural conflict between sustainability and fire safety? Well, yeah, the answer to that is 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 absolutely. And you know, one of the, the issues to do with combustible cladding is that people put combustible cladding on there to increase the insulation um, of the facade or envelope, building envelope, in order to uh, reduce the amount of heat gain or heat loss through the facade for sustainability reasons. Um, uh, and uh, and, and uh, so by putting those facades on and making them out of combustible material, met maybe a sustainability thing, but in the end created a fire safety problem uh, that wasn't looked at. Of course, the other big thing at the moment is is the move to timber and use of mass timber buildings, uh, glue lam and LVL and and cross laminated timber uh, for again for sustainability reasons, um, particularly where you can use local timber and don't need to import it from other countries um, because of the the lower uh, carbon um, uh, rating, if you like, for timber compared with steel and concrete. Um, and but that has its own challenge. Obviously, the the, the timber, if it's exposed, uh, gets involved in the fire, and we need to understand how um, that timber structure, or and and or timber framework or timber uh, walls, ceiling, floor, uh, contribute to um, the fire problem. We know for small residential buildings with lots of small compartments. We know reasonably well how to do that. For large floor plate commercial buildings, we don't know how to do that very well at all because we don't have you know, sufficient research at the moment and we need to do it very, very conservatively, which means if we have CLT uh, walls and ceiling in the building, we probably need to encapsulate or cover up uh, those in, in um, it more, than, more than leave them exposed, which is perhaps good from a sustainability point of view, but from an aesthetic point of view, architects want to show the beautiful timber. Um, so there's a real conflict there that fire safety engineers need to contribute and need to think carefully about uh, and work with the architect and other consultants to balance out the sustainability and, uh, and fire safety provisions. Any other questions or clarifications you want on any of those? Uh, You're welcome, then. I've got two, if uh, we don't have any more on the chat. Yeah. Uh, I think we don't. Uh, it's more like um, 
seeking your <laughs> valuable opinion, not so much a question, but the first one, the first point is uh, when you were talking about um, complex buildings uh, and then the the man and mandatory inspections and, uh, in terms of mandatory inspections and specialized commissioning, uh, do you reckon that this can be imposed by NCC in the future, such that all states and territories can actually adopt this? Um, because as you know, some st some states like, for example, Western Australia don't even require registration if you're a fire safety engineer uh, and they don't mandate inspection sign offs. Uh, it, like, for example, they do New South Wales, although in New South Wales, the, mand the mandatory one is only the only one. Um, yep. And in, in my opinion, I, I think we should be involved, as you said, throughout the stage, the construction stage of a project, because uh, one of the worst um, uh, times I've had in projects was when the project was near completion and all these issues uh, were coming out, all these non-compliances yeah. that we had to address for the builder. Yeah. Uh, and there's just this pressure getting the building uh, completed, but at the same time uh, having to address all these problems yeah. and get adding this pressure on yourself. And uh, and unfortunately, what happens in reality, it, it's very difficult to get a client to agree to, to have a fire safety engineer uh, carrying out inspections like uh, a certifier does uh, throughout the life of, of a building just because of the cost. But if this was mandated in a federal level, um, then the states will be uh, forced to uh, apply this because now this varies a lot from, from state to yeah, state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that. What, what that's do you, a, what do you well, think? Where are we heading? What's your, uh, what's your gut that's feeling? A, that's a <laughs> massive question. And, and <laughs> part, of the pro part of the problem is the Commonwealth develops the National Building Code, but they've got absolutely no powers to implement it at the state and territory level. Every right. state and territory level is responsible under the Constitution for building regulations and building legislation. Uh -huh. So they all tend to do their own thing. And of course, Queensland thinks it's smarter than New South Wales, and New South Wales thinks it's smarter than Victoria and WA. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, you know, I'm on a panel next week at the Fire Australia conference talking about national consistency. Mm, that's a good <laughs> yeah. day. And and, and, the, and in fact, I'm doing some research at the moment with the idea of writing up a paper with David Lang about where we're up to at the moment with the recommendations of the Building Confidence Report. And the answer is we're all over the place. You know, on, on registration of fire safety engineers, you know, it's in Queensland, it's in Victoria, in New South Wales, it's only for class two residential buildings. It's in Tasmania. Western Australia have got proposed legislation, but they're not going to implement it for four or five years. South Australia got nothing. Um, exactly. yeah. You know, at the moment in Western Australia, you have to register if you're a painter painting fences or houses, but you don't have to register as a fire safety engineer at the moment. Yeah. The, the idea of mandatory inspections by the fire safety engineers during construction is gradually getting some interest, particularly in New South Wales, where they're probably going to introduce it soon um, and uh, require the fire safety engineers to do a series of inspections, witness commissioning, and certify that the building complies with the building code. But it's at the moment, it's it's all over the place. And all right. we can do as a profession is encourage governments to go down that path and certainly in New South Wales they are pushing very hard to get the designs done right from the beginning at concept and design for building permit yep. to get away from all the problems in yep. uh, construction because it is a horrible job to go in as you know at the end of a project and try and sort out all the problems that um that the developer and the builder don't want to do because it's going to cost money and it's going to delay the project. And, uh, and, and often the building surveyor wants to gloss over some of those things because that's going to cause grief as well. And that's just, you know, for a professional person, a very challenging place to be. So I'm afraid the, the news is not <laughs> good. It's a bit hopeful. Things are happening a little bit, but uh, we've got, um, yeah, still quite a long way to go in that regard. Because, mm. yeah, I, I mean, I've only seen this happening only if the client was keen to to get the fire safety engineer involved. And that was a solely a client uh, requirement. Um, yep. But other than that, 
they will try to do the bare minimum, um, which is unfortunate. The the other point I um, I was seeking your view on was about the uh, good practice that we said before, because um, we we tend to what what we tend to see is that um, let's say you have a thirty story building, and uh, the base build design is done by some tier one or uh, tier two for, uh, fire safety engineering firm or consultancy. And then um, throughout the life of the building, uh, they change occupants. So, the, uh, and some people, you know, some companies want to get three floors, others want to uh, lease uh, four floors, and then the, they they open up uh, uh, those floors, they create an atrium or, so they change the fire safety strategy of the building. And yep. usually um, those fit outs uh, are done by uh, fire safety engineers who didn't do yep. the base build design. Who don't necessarily understand the the strategy of, of, of the entire building, um, and it's it's a bit hard as well, like to to get yeah, to yeah. Um, and they look at this part. Probably they read the fire safety engineering report done by the the firm who did the whole building design, the holistic building design, and then and then that's it. Um, and you get this building throughout the years and it involves the completely different um, uh, fire safety strategy for for the whole building. So. Sure holistic design is kind of thrown out, out of the window um well this is where you know I, I, certainly again in new south wales but coming in other states as well is this idea of a building manual right i was going to say the fire is safety there... engineer should be involved in providing a building manual um which has a has a simple english part which building occupants can understand what the fire strategy is and what the fire safety measures are but all of the technical information about their, including the fire engineering reports, mm -hmm. written in a way that people can understand, is all saved on, in the case of New South Wales now, their electronic e-portal, um, so that anyone coming along to design and change the building in the future can see exactly what and why it was designed in a particular way originally. And uh, that that's a, a major step forward. Again, that was a recommendation of the Building Confidence Report. and. It's happening in New South Wales, and I okay. think it's about to happen in Victoria as well. So that's, um, yeah, uh, that's certainly a way forward, I think, there. Oh, okay. There's one more question here. Should I, well, I've got yes. time to answer that, Cyril? Yeah, we, we do. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, thanks. Thank about you. Uh, artificial and technology applied to building design process, and uh, what's your opinion or what's Arab's opinion about this? Yeah, look, and, and the answer is, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I know very little about um, artificial intelligence. Um, I've certainly got none of it. And um, uh, the whole business about automated drawings and smart engineering analysis. What, what I do know is that, you know, uh, on all major projects now, building information technology is being used as the, the vehicle in which everybody inputs their information. Um, and uh, from that, you know, the the drawings are automatically drawn out and sent to fabricators and others. Um, and, uh, uh, and and there's certainly an idea that into that building information uh, modeling, the fire engineering modeling, the egress modeling, the structural modeling should all fit into that to give you one whole picture of the building. Um, and certainly, Arup is is uh, working very hard to uh, adopt all that digital technology. And there's a whole uh, raft of people in 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 Arup and in, and in other com companies, um, you know, looking at how to do that in a in a smarter way uh, than we've done in the past. Because in the past, um, you know, all the different engineering disciplines have tended to work in silos. And again, this has been observed in the construction of buildings in New South Wales through their audits. Uh, nobody's brought all the bits together um, and to make sure they all work together. And this has been true in fire safety engineering. We've had performance solutions developed by different people that don't work together, let alone work with the rest of the building. And that's, you know, I think that's changing and and building information management, BIM systems and, and AI is going to change and and improve a lot of those things, I think, into the future uh, as we go as we go digital and we we don't do physical drawings anymore, where they're all produced and kept 
you know, in an e-environment um, for not only for the building and the construction, but for future users of the building as well. Uh, and that that's 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 a really important development. Any others? I'm happy to be here for as long as you like. <clears throat> Certainly, I can say, in, you know, in summary, I think, as I've tried to say, that this whole business of, you know, using this concept of building complexity, which is really talking about building risk, because government ministers hate talking about, you know, buildings having a certain risk level. They hate the word risk because risk to them means it might happen and then they might have to answer in parliament when something went wrong. Um, so they don't like using the word risk. So they're using the word complexity, but building complexity or building risk being a being the primary driver for design um, and analysis and inspections and peer review is 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 really growing in, in interest uh, in the fire safety and the regulatory community generally. Um, and the use of performance um, solutions is, I think, continuing to grow. And the need for fire safety engineers to do the design, to be smart designers out there sitting at the table with architects in the, and engineers at the, at the very first day of a project. Um, and then working all their way through uh, the whole design to the end is really a wonderful engineering opportunity, I guess, for, for graduates into the future. I, I guess, and I, I've said this before, I think, at, at UQ, um, the greatest project I worked on was the Femen Belt Tunnel, which was a 18 kilometer road and rail tunnel between Denmark and Germany. And I was called in as the fire safety engineer on the very first day in Copenhagen with 50 other people to brainstorm the design for four days. We were locked up in a hotel and fed food and beer and wine and things. Um, and we spent four days brainstorming that from day one. And 10 years later, we, while it's in construction, we're still involved. But that, that opportunity to influence the design, um, which we did by proposing deluge systems in the road tunnel and rail tunnel, that opportunity to influence design on day one, that, that was the most exciting few days I think ever in my career. Um, and, and you know, I think it's, if you like that sort of stuff, it's a great opportunity to, to be, you know, a fire safety engineer leading project. And equally, if your passion is doing modeling analysis and analysis, uh, whether it be finite element analysis or egress modeling or, or fire, um, a scenario analysis, then that's another whole great opportunity um, in fire safety engineering. If that's if that's what your passion and and what you're uh, what you're good at good at. So it's um exciting time. There's lots of opportunities, and so as I say, go and talk to every one of your colleagues and get three of them to do fire safety engineering with you, and we'll all be better off. And and then I'll be able to finally retire. Thanks, Ms. Peter. Um, I actually got one simple question. So I noticed you actually use one of your slides. You use diagram uh, buildings um, as one of your example uh, as a complex buildings. Yeah. I just want to know from your experience, what major challenges you when you deal with like diagram high rise buildings? And uh, we, I know kind of so this kind of uh, structure system can actually went to really complex, like uh, they have a lot of uh, freedom, like uh, compared with then the regular buildings. So I just want to know, like, did you have any experience or like what's a, ma a major challenge to dealing? Well, as a, I, yeah. yeah. The I I wasn't the I wasn't, I think I did a little bit of review on that project, but I wasn't the primary designer. The primary designer was a guy in Sydney called John Hewitt, who used to work for us. He's now at the University of Sydney. He's a, both a structural engineer and qualified as both a structural engineer and a fire safety engineer. And I think he worked with the architects when they first had the idea of putting this diagrid thing on the outside. 
the challenge, of course, always is if you have a fire that breaks through the windows of the building and exposes it and and um, exposes fire on the structure on the outside, will it fail? Um, it's the same as the very famous Pompidou Center in Paris, if you know that building, another famous yes, I do. iconic yeah. Arab building. Now, in the case of uh, in the case of uh, the Macquarie building uh, with the diagrid on the outside, the steel was all encased in fire rated material um, to stop those getting too hot. Um, and and in the case of Pompidou, the steel on the outside is hollow and is filled with water that cools it. So there's water running through that. Uh, external thing all of the time. They're, they're two totally different solutions to the same problem of an external structure. So the impact of the fire coming out of the building through a window, a broken window, and exposing itself on the structure was the issue. And part of the part of that is looking to see what happens if one element of it fails. Is the structure resilient enough to hold up the whole building as a whole structure, where you might lose one small element of it that's another part of the design challenge i think to look at 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 how you might deal with that um from that point of view and it's it's exactly what we deal with in facade of airport for instance we often leave bare steel um columns supporting the roof of a of a an external uh, wall and a roof of an airport and one of the analysis we do is look at what happens if one of those columns fails will the roof still stay up so is there effectively a level of redundancy and resilience um, as part of the design? That that was certainly the challenge on that Macquarie building in 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 Sydney. Thanks. I think uh, we are about to finish today's presentation. And once again, thanks very much for such great presentation today at the uh, UQ F SFPE Sharp Student Structures. No worries. I, I love coming to UQ. I love interacting with uh, all you young people who've got your whole careers ahead of you. It's uh, it's it's wonderful. It's a uh, it's a great profession. Um, I'm sure you'll you'll love it. Whatever you're d doing in in designing buildings or doing modeling analysis or research or um, there's there's you know great opportunities and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you. A number of you again the next time I'm in uh, in Brisbane at UQ. Yes, I just want to say like uh, other people still here. We're going to upload the recording to our YouTube channel, like uh, UQ SFP YouTube channel. If you want to uh, rewatch it or share it with your uh, colleague or classmates, uh, feel free to do that. And uh, yep, I think uh, hope everyone have a good weekend. Yeah. No. Thank you, Peter. Glass of wine time Thank you. for me, I think. <laughs> well, well deserved. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. All right. See you later, guys. See Enjoy you. the weekend. Bye. See you, you too. Bye. Thanks.